Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Diamond Hands podcast. Today, guys, we are so excited to have Mary Rob, the CEO and founder of Social Practice in Texas, and they serve businesses nationwide. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for having me, Leslie. I'm so excited to be here. Same. I know we've been trying to do this for like a little while, guys, like between you and I, and this happens to everybody, I got burnt out. Let's be honest, <laughs> like burnt out. And now we're back. Yeah, but it's all good. That's why 2022 going 2023, we probably need to have someone like you in our lives. Oh, I'm here for it. Well, I'm glad we made it today. So I'm excited mm-hmm. to talk about social media. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, you know, first I just want to start with our, for our listeners, for you. So tell me about the gap that you saw in the industry and why you started social practice and how are you doing this and killing this as such a young entrepreneur? Tell us about it. Yeah. So I actually, I've worked in several different advertising and marketing agencies and um, the last two companies I worked with, most of our clients were doctors. They're a set of practices, plastic serves, med spas, dentists. And I continually kept getting the question, Mary, what do we do about our social media? How do we handle this? How do we grow it? How can we use it to drive patients to our practice? Mm-hmm. And to be honest, the agencies that I was working at, the agencies that I knew about in the industry, Um, Even individual consultants, I didn't have anybody that I knew I could call and say, hey, can you run and manage these socials for these clients? Because there are a lot of kind of band-aid solutions out there, especially in the agency world. They want to be able to serve their clients. Just I I could not find um, anybody that really Mm -hmm. addressed every single piece of it from continual content creation. So having photos and videos developed inside the practice, because that's huge to mm-hmm. posting all the channels from, from the feed to stories, to reels, to TikTok, to the biggest part, which is community engagement. So um, responding to people who reach out to you, but also spending time reaching out to your local community so that you build a local following. Um, so I, I essentially saw a gap in the market. Um, I piloted the business in 2019 and was really mm-hmm. successful with it. Um, quit my job within three months and just took it from there. <laughs> That's so great. And and I, and I think what you said there was really key though, uh, building that local presence and that local community, because guys, any of you guys listening out there, it's one thing to go viral. It's another thing for those people to be actually people who could actually use your services. Like if you get 700 likes in India, that's you. If you're in New York or Minnesota, or it's not going to help you. No, it's not. And I think that's where a lot of confusion happens. And some of, there are certain um, companies that I've seen that do this, where they have social media clients, but they buy all these followers, they buy all this engagement. And we run into this every so often with our clients who have done that in the past. And it's really, it's a huge issue because what happens is they end up losing more followers than they gain every month because they're spam bot followers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then their engagement, when you look into their insights and you look into seeing how the, the profiles are performing, they're, all of their audience members are overseas in places like China and India. And, you know, we really specialize in um, small to medium-sized businesses, people who really want a local audience. So it's mm-hmm. truly not impactful. Um, so, yeah, I just, I saw a lot of that too. And that's something we, we strongly advise against. So mm-hmm. um, that's kind of where our strategy is, is kind of unique in a sense in that we are very, very focused on building up a local audience for these practices. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that's really great because how does a practice owner actually distinguish when they're going to find a practice, like, you know, a social practice to take over their, 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 their you know, their company? creation like how do you distinguish because everybody's running around saying oh hey yeah we're going to get you followers we're going to get you new clients we're going to get you this so how do they differentiate with all this noise that's in the marketplace that's a great question i think there's a couple of questions you can ask when you're interviewing different companies or even um, individuals i think one of the most important things is working with a marketing partner social media partner who understands your business. They understand Mm. practices. They understand med spas. They understand aesthetic procedures because Mm. in any marketing strategy that you invest in, 
the big picture, especially from a content perspective, is how can I tell my story? How can I set myself apart from my competition? And how can I add value to my patients? So if I'm going to show up, if I'm going to invest in this strategy, right, to help drive business to my practice, what kind of things are going to be created that add value to my target patient? Um, so number one, I'd say is just looking for individuals who have experience marketing and doing social media for the aesthetic space. Um, mm -hmm. The next thing I would look at is get examples of their work, ask what other profiles they manage, start to get an idea of what their creative looks like. What do their photos look like? What do their videos look like? I would be really careful about partnering with people who are very graphic heavy. Um, graphics are pretty, but the reality is graphics don't get a lot of engagement. They don't reach a lot of people. Social media content that gets the most engagement is very video heavy. It's authentic content inside the practice. Now I understand that that's more challenging, but there is a way to do it. Um, so, so start looking at, you know, the clients that they work with just, you know, visually looking through their, their content. The last thing I'd say is something that you can ask, um, your, your, the person you're interviewing or, or the company you're looking into is what does success look like for your clients? You know, what, what, it, what are you able to drive for your clients? What are those results? Um, something that I ask clients during my sales process is what are your biggest expectations of this campaign? Because for me, I want to make sure that my team understands what is the main goal. The goal is always going to be to drive patients, but mm -hmm. every client's a little bit different in what they're looking for. So, um, I want to make sure we're meeting your expectations, but also, you know, you want to, you want to ask these marketing, you know, individuals, what, what their even case studies look like. I always suggest mm -hmm. case studies, asking for references. Yeah, and, and I think that is really key there, you know, asking for references, case studies, seeing what they've done in the past, and you hit it right on the head there, like, what does success look like for your client? Because what one person might think looks like, looks like success, another one might not, mm -hmm. you know, um, some people, I think it depends, like, you know, how do you deal with like, the different types of practices? Because I know there's, um, you know, different stages, of course, there's like the startup practice, and they're really just trying to get people in the door. Um, there's the mid-state practice, not only are they trying to get people in the door, but they're trying to make sure they have a good brand so they attract people. And then you also have, you know, the, you know, the mature practices who they can't take on another client, but they want to make sure that they're still out there and, and engaging with a potential audience if they get a second location or a third or a fourth, who knows? So for you, how do you come in? It has your team come in when it's a beginner stage, when it's a mid stage, when it's a, you know, mature stage business. Yeah. So that's just where strategy comes into play. And we're really, really big about being strategic with our efforts. Um, so depending on the life cycle for a beginner stage, you know, you're new to the market. We really want to start focusing on what sets you apart. What are your credentials? What can you do that's maybe different or unique? Um, we like to talk a lot about to patient experience. That is such a big deal in the aesthetic space. So what kind of experience are you providing for these patients? What can they expect? Um, and it's really just educating your local audience about who you guys are. And then of course, going into your procedures as well. Um, whenever you're kind of in the middle, um, you're still wanting to grow, but you kind of have a baseline. It's going to be similar things, but it might be some more educational type of content. You are going to have more results that you can share. Um, really, again, focusing on the things that make your practice different could be talking about things that you've added in over the years. One thing that's kind of um, trending right now is you also something that's a it's kind of a smaller, more, more tangible thing you can do. Um, resharing certain content that did really, really well in the past, maybe six months to a year ago. Um, that's always an option and something to consider. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to a more mature practice, if they're not really wanting to generate leads, but they're just wanting to have a presence in the market, that's where we're going to have more branding related, related content. And that's more, you know, things about the practitioner, things about the practice. Um, it can be more culture related. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case, but sometimes it might be. They're more focused on recruiting and maintaining talent. And that's where, you know, the marketing efforts can really help with that and just talk about um, experiences related to working inside this practice. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's definitely something we look at. It's one of the, the number one questions we ask when we're building a content strategy is what are your biggest goals in the next couple of years? So, mm -hmm. you know, if it's brand awareness or if it's drive new patients or if it's, you know, attract, you know, talent to work inside my practice, those are the things to consider. 
And I think that's excellent. And so another question that I have for you that um, people would be wondering about, like, do you guys also do brand strategy or do you say, okay, I'll source someone else for brand strategy and then come back? Because, you know, because brand strategy in, in my mind, like having a brand is going to be the base of all the social media content. So what happens if they don't have that? That is such a good question. And it's funny, I'm in the middle of building a partnership with a branding strategy company. Mm, um, nice. We're very campaign related, right? So we're really focused on generating content, driving traffic, you know, having a monthly continual effort, you know, every single day we're doing different things to try and grow yeah. this profile. But we have noticed that there is an opportunity for us, um, especially for those practices that don't have this in place. Some of our clients do, but um, before you ever get into any sort of marketing, whether it's building your website, creating print material, putting signage on your practice, creating social content, all of that needs to be tied together. And that's where branding strategy is really, really crucial. Um, it is an investment, but I have to say it's going to be worth it because your brand if it's done right, it's going to last, you know, it's, it should mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one time investment. And unless you rebrand every five or 10 years, but if you really do it right the first time, you shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's definitely something really, uh, I think important to consider and if possible build into the budget. Yeah. And I, and I, and, and guys, those of you who are listening, I know it might seem daunting when you're in the beginning and you're thinking about all these things, but your brand is going to set the, it's going to set the, what's it called, the baseline for everything else you do, the type of people that you attract to your practice as patients. It's going to determine the type of people, the quality of people that you attract in to be injectors, you know, because all that brand strategy and that vision, it's going to be so important. And your social media strategy, without that, it's going to be tough because you're going to be going all around the place if you don't know who you are, what your DNA is. Yeah, and it's, it's, I was on the phone yesterday. Uh, it's so funny you brought this up because it is actually top of mind for me right now. It's kind of the next phase of the business I can't wait nice. to rolling out. But I don't know if you um, are familiar with Dry Bar. Um, Dry Bar. They're, they're, not, they're not the cycling place, are they? No, 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 just so, kidding. No. So the CEO, her name's Ali Webb. She does a lot of um, public speaking because she owns multiple companies. They also just rolled out a new franchise called Squeeze. It's a massage place, dry bars, a blowout bar. Um, mm -hmm. She's a really interesting entrepreneurial story, wildly successful in a very short mm -hmm. time. I think they have over 40, don't quote me on that, 40 plus franchise locations in like mm -hmm. it's insane. Wow. But the reason they were able to accomplish that is because, I mean, a huge part of it was their branding strategy. And if you look at their socials, from the second you go to their website, to their social media, to the second you walk up to their door, you can expect the same exact experience in every single location. And, mm -hmm. you know, the marketing does tie into the patient experience um, and the brand and all of that. It's all, all together. So it's, it's so important and it's so vital. And if you are a med spa and, you know, maybe you just want one location now, but who's to say after you guys hit a certain mark, hey, you might want to have another location. You might decide you mm -hmm. want five or 10. Mm -hmm. And so, um, or maybe you just want one and that's totally fine, but it's still, all of this stuff goes together. Aesthetics is very competitive. I, I believe it's supposed to double in the next two or three years. I was at a conference recently and it, they showed the numbers and it was crazy just how quickly mm -hmm. it's growing. So having an emphasis on that experience, having an emphasis on the design, the look, the feel of physically when you're in your practice, but also from a virtual perspective, it's just continually becoming more and more important. Yeah. And I mean, as, as you know, I, I see my clients and other different med spots getting, you know, bought up in the industry. It's like, it's almost like the ones with the strong brand over the long term win, you know, because they're the ones that are like, uh, kind of like swallowing these other practices as they're going forward. And, you know, that's going to continue to happen. And, and it's just like, you know, if you don't have something that's strong, you're not going to command top dollar because you don't have systems around your brand strategy. You don't have systems around your content. You don't, and, and, and like people don't understand that that does affect their equity and what is being done in the future. They, they don't realize it goes hand in hand. Totally. It really does. It's just, it's in my opinion, it's just as important as the people you hire because, because of course they're engaging with your patients and they're a huge part of your experience, but 
um, that piece of it is just as important. A hundred percent. And so another thing that I want to ask you about and people may be wondering is, you know, how do you guys ensure that, you know, you're HIPAA compliant as you have, like, you know, you might have different um, content managers accessing patient information and pictures and things like that. So what do you guys do to ensure HIPAA compliance throughout this whole entire social media content strategy process? I love that question. That's actually one of our also differentiating factors, but it, it is something that um, every single one of our team members is trained on HIPAA compliance. Mm. They can work with us until they go through our training. Nice. Um, but just to be helpful to the audience, you know, one of the things that's, of course, just hands down, the number one, what's the most important thing is every single person that you post on your channel has to have a HIPAA consent form signed. We have them if you need one. You can Google them. Um, I always suggest advising with your attorney once you build one, just to double check that it's good to go. But mm -hmm. do not pictures of anybody or videos of anybody until you have that signed. Um, from an online perspective, in terms of engaging with people, if someone comments or someone messages you, I can name a few scenarios. So let's say you get a message and a patient's asking about, you know, advice on a recent appointment they came in on. Maybe this happened the other day, like, oh, I'm starting to get a rash in this one spot. Um, can you tell me what to do? you always need to keep those conversations offline. So you can be really friendly and say, thank you so much for reaching out. We really appreciate you for coming in. I'm gonna get you in touch with our office manager or whoever um, so that you guys can you know, get this resolved. So you never wanna you know, discuss the details of a patient's uh, medical information online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's the biggest thing I would say. And then with any business, there's different ways to handle like negative commentary or bad reviews, things like that. But the, I think that's a little bit separate from HIPAA. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's going to be handled the same way regardless. You want to take the conversation offline. But the biggest thing in the HIPAA space is with patient information, especially if they're sharing it with you in the DMs, is you don't want to give medical advice. You don't want to talk about the details of their of their case. Mm -hmm. um, we've doctors kind of slip up a little bit here just be careful because it, especially if you're the one managing the profile yourself um and i know patients might reach out and you have a good relationship with them you trust them and just be careful about the things you're talking about because worst case scenario god forbid anything ever happens and this person wants to come after or report you for anything mm -hmm. you don't have that kind of stuff in your um social media inboxes or yeah. And, and that's so true. And it's funny that you actually, you know, kind of touched upon, um, you know, the reviews and responding to them. And, and that can also be an, an issue too, because, you know, private information can be disclosed if someone says, oh yeah, this is what we did. And you're like, no, we didn't do that. Or have you have you start discussing their case publicly. So practitioners, as you said, they have to be so careful, just have a canned response. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a good point. That is actually, you know, now that you bring that up, you know, for like, oh, I came in and you did X, Y, Z. And then I've seen this happen where someone at the, on the practices side, they respond with, well, no, this is what we really did. Yeah, you can't do that. So it's always mm -hmm. like short, sweet, you know, we're so sorry that you feel this way. Don't ever like tell them that they're correct. But, you know, we'd love to reach out to you and like make this right. Please contact X, Y, Z. But yeah, never disclose the details of what they came in for. Um, mm -hmm in that scenario. Yeah, I think that's great. So like when you're training your, um, you know, your people, or even if you have someone that's kind of working with inside the practice to manage your social, do you kind of like, like, do you kind of like build out those processes for them so they understand like what to do when those situations come up? Yeah, so um, for all of the people that are on our engagement team and our writing team, because those mm -hmm. are the ones are in the profiles and having these conversations, they go through an online training with us. It's about an hour mm -hmm. long. And okay. um, that's where we train them on, you know, how to handle conversations. One of the, the biggest things that we always suggest is if there's something that comes through that you're not sure how to respond to, or um, it's, it is kind of more of a HIPAA, you know, related conversation. We just have them mm -hmm. screenshot of the conversation, um, and email it to the client themselves, and then we'll go from there. Awesome. Okay. And, you know, and then also with, um, you know, reporting, how important is it to uh, track numbers, track how content is performing? How do you guys do that? And what kind of results do you get from actually tracking 
tracking and what do you track? <laughs> That's a great question. So on social media, there are a lot of different things to be looking at. First and foremost is how's the content performing? Um, all of the insights can be found on these social channels. Um, mm -hmm. Our agency has an agency. Um, we have our own software dashboard that our clients can log into and you can see stats from all the profiles we're managing. It just makes it a little bit easier mm -hmm. having into you know, each individual page. Um, but we want to see what posts got the most reach, the most likes, the most impressions, because we'll look at that information and we'll want to create more content like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. When it comes to measuring ROI, um, that's where things can get a little tricky, but we do have some systems in place to help. Because what happens is someone might see you on social media, right? And then there's a lot of different ways they can come through. They can slide through <laughs> your video. They can click mm -hmm. on a link in the bio. They can call you. They could go click out of social media, go into Google, Google your name, and then find your phone number. It just depends on that person's flow. But um, some of the ways that we're able to track that is we do have a call tracking number on our profile. So that way we can track anyone that calls um, that way. We have a landing page on that's linked to their bio. So if people submit a, a consult form, we can track people that want to you know, enter that way. And then we do track the DMs as well. And even the comments sometimes we'll have someone that will say something like, you know, oh my gosh, I really want to schedule this. When can I get in? And a comment. So mm -hmm. we have a Google Sheet that will track those things in. Um, mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to the measuring success, definitely, you know, how many leads am I getting from this? How many patients are reaching out? Um, and don't disqualify existing patients because one of the things about the aesthetic space is you guys have so many procedures that you offer, right? And maybe someone comes in for Botox and your team doesn't always have time to, you know, walk them through all 20, 30, 40 procedures you offer. But this person, if they follow you on social and they start seeing, oh, well, that's cool. Like that cool sculpting or, mm -hmm. um, or whatever. There's so many different things. The hydrofacial, oh, that's great. I'd love to get that. Now, because they've already been to you, they, they're following you on your socials. Now they might come back through and say, actually, I want to try that next time. So Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, measuring the ROI and then measuring just how the posts are performing. And then of course, followers, I mean, we, we want to grow followers. That's important as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say just how engaged your audience is, is more important. And then how much, um, traffic and, and leads you're generating is key. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because I've seen both ends of the spectrum, like I've seen people that have 3000 following and, but they have a great full practice and they're doing very well. And I've seen people that have a huge following. I don't know where they got it from. <laughs> and, you know, they're not as booked and as busy as they want to be. So it's like, and I think that's a really important thing for people to understand that those things don't always correlate. Sometimes it's better to have a smaller audience, but they're engaged and having this big old monster and it's not doing anything for you. Yeah. A lot of times when they have that many, I mean, it's very rare, especially just on the business side of things. Like, that I come across a business page, a practice page, and it has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers, and they're not all bots. And you can figure that out pretty quickly. We actually have a tool that does that for us. But... Damn. <laughs> so um... it's like I'm like, how do you have like 113,000 followers and you got five comments? I'm like, this is not commensurate. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, and that's we measure that too. We have a free social media analysis that we can do for anybody, and mm -hmm. that's one of the look at is engagement rate because it's yeah five comments divided by 130,000 followers like no one's seeing your content because you probably have fake followers oh, it's such a shame oh my god so you know for so for your practice owners you know what I would say like what would be the if you could leave them with anything what would be like the top three tips that you would leave with um, practice owners as we're going into 2023 and kind of looking into last quarter and those next year strategies, what would you recommend your top three? So the first and foremost thing, most important video, we have to get comfortable doing video. And I know at first it can be intimidating, but one thing you can do is download TikTok, download Instagram, spend time every day looking at videos in the feed so that you can understand what kind of content's performing well. But um, the better, the quicker that you adapt to video, everyone has an iPhone these days. I mean, you can easily do it yourself if you have the time for it. Um, but if you want your social media to be successful, you've got to have video content in there. 
The second thing is planning, um, you know, being a busy practice owner and having a team and growing, growing, growing. If you don't have a plan, it's not going to be executed. So get a plan in place. And I guess my piggyback to that point there is have someone in the practice that owns this task, just one person. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of times in the aesthetic space, you know, you, you have multiple people that, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. But have one person that will be held accountable for making sure that the content happens and that they have a plan. We actually, as an agency, we plan quarterly content. So we come up with a list of topics, we pick what days we're going to share them, and then we, we um, create content in bulk. So essentially, we go out and we film and get photos for content that we're going to use for at least three to six months. Um, so that will help you. And that's all part of planning. Um, the third tip I would say is get on TikTok. <laughs> honestly. Um, and I know it, the, the thing about TikTok is it has grown so fast. It's probably going to be bigger than Instagram. It's already getting really close to that. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I, that's just one of the things that it, it's, I have such like a, I, I see both sides of it, but as a business owner and, um, you know, if you want to be competitive and stay ahead of the competition, get on TikTok, um, build a profile. Any of the reels you create can easily be put on TikTok and or vice versa. So those are the three top things I'd say for next year. Awesome. That's so great. And then Mary, um, I know you had mentioned like a free analysis that practice owners can go through. So if you want to tell our listeners a little bit more about that and how they can get access to the free analysis with you guys, it'd be great. Yeah. So what we do is we will look at your profiles. Mostly a lot of our clients have Instagram. So we'll look at your Instagram. We'll look at your creative uh, quality. We'll look at how often you're showing up. We'll look at your engagement rate. And then we have a report that kind of walks through how the social media algorithm works, what your opportunities for improvement are, um, and more information on us. So it really kind of boils down what you're currently doing and gives you some tips and tricks there. If you want access to it, just go to our Instagram at Social Practice US and click the link in our bio and you'll see the button that says free social media analysis and we'll get you one sent over. Awesome. So guys, you heard that. So Social Practice US on Instagram and you can find all of their things there. And Mary, it has been so great having you on our podcast and thanks for you know, sharing some of your wisdom with our listeners today. Sure, everyone's going to love it or they love it already because they've already listened by this point.